you might be in a hurry to get out of here, but if you can at all wait, please wait. If you absolutely have to leave at any time during the lecture, please don't leave. But if you absolutely have to, please don't slam the door. It's really annoying. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so today's lecturer is Dr. Francisco Vasquez. He is a full professor in the Hutchins School, a professor of what we call the history of ideas. This is a little bit about what would that mean. Uh, we invite Dr. Vasquez to give this talk because he is especially interested in the concept of something called the continental American. Okay, so think a little bit to explain what that means, but also what do you think that means? Um, and then we hope you can be, he's going to help you think very differently about the relationship between people living in the United States, we call ourselves Americans, but all of the other people living in countries that also consider themselves to be Americans, right? What is the relationship between us and them? Uh, he also has a really, really interesting interpretation of what Fuku means in Oscar Well, um, something that I think you're really going to want to think about more work in this seminar. Okay, so write down your questions on your interest cards. Hold on to them at the end. We'll pass them to the last. And let's give Dr. Vasquez a very warm FYU welcome. I hope you find uh, my ideas useful in your understanding of uh, the wondrous life of Oscar Wilde. So my take on the brief wondrous uh, life of Oscar Wilde by Juno Diaz is a political economic one. I asked myself four questions and I came up with some answers. And I look forward to discussing your take on these questions this evening during dinner. So my first question is, why is the epigraph to the novel a reference to Galactus? You know who Galactus is? No, huh? Okay. Galactus is a godlike being with an insatiable hunger who eats an entire planets and universes. So I see there are not a lot of comic book readers. Um, and, and Galactus says in the epigraph, and this is like the very beginning of the book, of what import are brief, nameless lives to Galactus, unquote. And I would add, of what import are anyone or anything for that matter to Galactus, Galactus is worlds. So why is that there? Why is that the first thing that, that's in the novel? Second question, why does the novel begin with the discovery of America? And when I say America, I don't mean the United States, I mean the continent, or a new field of science called hemispheric studies, means the continent, continental studies. So why does the novel begin with the discovery of America and with the notion of the curse that he calls Fuku Americanus that was carried with the screams of slaves? What does that mean? So my take on that is that to define reality as continental hemispheric Americans, whether we're Dominicans or US Americans or Mexicans, whatever, we need to understand that our actions are framed within a power so great that to make sense of it, we need to refer to science fiction, comic books, and Foucault curses. The American Foucault equals Galactus, equals, here's another comic book character, Darksider, <coughs> equals the military industrial complex, which in its current form, you know it as global capitalism. So to me, Galactus is global capitalism. Global capitalism eats worlds. And at the same time, though, not to depress you too much, a promise of social justice or respect for human dignity. So that's the discovery of, of, uh, of America. I do disagree with one reviewer who thinks that this novel is either too much or a poor attempt at magical realism. I think the curse is the central character of the story, or at the very least, if Oscar is the protagonist, Foucault is the antagonist. At any rate, it is a key point of the novel and of my talk today. Third question, why does the poem after the first epigraph introduce a man 
who is mixed race and who is either nobody or a nation, quote unquote. A man who is running away from the poisoning of the soul with, quote, their big house, big car, big time, bobol, unquote. Bobol, if anybody bothered to look it up, means fraud. Like somebody in conjunction with the government engaging in fraud. A man, however, who, quote, so when these slums of empire was paradise, unquote. When was that? So my take on that question is, some claim that the novel focuses on the viewpoint of diaspora, dispersion, scattering, displacement, migration from the Dominican Republic. I believe it exemplifies the symbiotic, and by that I mean interdependent, relationship that we all, continental, hemispheric Americans, have with each other. There is a dialectic. I give and take here. A struggle of the man nation against the fuku as the poisoning of the soul. There is also a sense that there is a better world somewhere in the past, and you saw the possibility of a better world in the future. My fourth question, my fourth and final question. If Colombo brought the fuku to America, the continent, how does it affect you? How does it affect us? today. So my take on that is the blank pages <coughs> in the novel towards the end, as well as the faceless men that appear in the novel, are symbols of the amnesia that comes with cultural hegemony. By cultural hegemony, I mean that even though the political economic structure makes it so that only 1% accumulates all of the goodies, the illusion is created that just that we can all have the freedom to express ourselves politically and otherwise, we can all get rich at some point. That's hegemony, it's an illusion. Other art in Oscar's manuscripts are missing after their deaths. I'm assuming you already read the novel and I'm kind of ruining it for you. Uh, we don't know who the enemy is. We don't know what the real or the entire story is. <coughs> And I don't mean just in the novel. I mean in our real lives, we don't really know who the enemy is. We don't really know who's affecting our lives. It's kind of very blurry out there. How do we begin? What can I do? So this is one of the biggest problems in understanding what is going on today, the fact that we lack a historical perspective. So we are always focusing on one frame and not on the entire film. My main point, <clears throat> after asking these questions, and my main point here, is that this apparently Dominican story is best understood within the context of the history of America, again, the continent, and the evolution of this Foucault, which may not be so Americanus or Dominicanus as it is humanus. In other words, it's a human curse, not just Dominican. Part of my intent here is to argue against a cultural, quote unquote, cultural reading of the novel. The life of Oscar Wilde and his family, the history of the Dominican Republic, with its peculiar inhabitants, weird people who grew up calling themselves Indios and thinking of themselves white until they visit the US and find out that they're black, sound very exotic very off-center, very abnormal. The same goes for other Latino themes, like violence, sexuality, and power in both men and women. Culture, I believe, is a function of historical and material conditions. It is not embedded in the souls or the genetic makeup of our people. It is not an essence. In response to this invitation to provide a transnational reading of the novel, I'm going to share with you my version of the story of the Foucault and how it affects you and all of us today and how we may possibly use the Safa, which is mentioned in the novel. Chicanos, we say, con Safos, and that means to get out of it, uh, to save ourselves from these galactics. The Foucault, you know, Diaz mentions in the Wonders Life of Oscar Wilde, is the birth of the modern world. 
which in turn gave birth first to the military industrial complex and then to global capitalism. In Americanity as Concept, or the Americas in the Modern World System, that's the title of an article, Aníbal Quijano and Emmanuel Wallerstein make a similar claim that the discovery of America, the continent, was the essential ingredient. Think about it as the missing 21 chromosomes for the growth of capitalism. <coughs> and I think that's, that's what the novel is really getting at. And so you are probably asking yourselves, in what sense did one say that the new world gave birth to the modern world and to global capitalism? Before the discovery of America, the continent, according to European history, there were only three continents which were supposed to reflect the Holy Trinity. The discovery of a new world opened the way to a new conception of the nature of the world, of human nature, and to the economic expansion of Europe through colonization of the rest of the world and also of its own peoples. <clears throat> The mineral and natural wealth of America, the continent, fed the economic development of Europe and through it of the rest of the world. All of the gold and all of the silver that went from Latin America, from Spanish America to Europe, went to feed the Industrial Revolution. So how exactly did this happen? So the modern world in which we live evolved from three contributions or consequences that came from the discovery of America. I always use discovery in quotation marks because it was really more like an invasion, a European invasion. So these three contributions are one, colonialism and coloniality, which is a word that you may not be familiar with. Number two, the creation of ethnicities and racism through a massive systematic labor system. And three, the concept of newness in progress. Let's first briefly look at colonialism and coloniality and start with a definition. Colonialism is a relationship between an indigenous or forcibly important majority and a minority of foreign invaders. The fundamental decisions affecting the lives of the colonized people are made and implemented by the colonial rulers in pursuit of interests that are often defined in a distant metropolis Rejecting cultural compromises with the colonized population, the colonizers are convinced of their own superiority and their ordained mandate to rule. So that's the definition of colonialism. The American Foucault for the indigenous people was an apocalypse, the destruction of their world, the appropriation of land and resources, and the, impositions of, the imposition of beliefs. But I would even go a step further. Even for the indigenous Europeans, it also takes over a lifestyle. You don't usually hear the word indigenous and Europeans put together. But they were European peasants. They were Europeans who were close to the earth, who believed in leprechauns, who believed in witches, who believed in gnomes, uh, who believed in magic. And those people were also decimated by the Industrial Revolution and by internal colonialism. So we're not talking about the poor Indians or the poor black slaves. We're talking about people all over the world that were affected by colonialism. Have you ever heard of the Luddites? Those are considered to be people that are against um, progress. And the Luddites were people who lived in England who took sledgehammers and destroyed the factories because the factories were um, basically destroying their own way of life or being able to produce the goods that they needed, like wool, to, to sell in, in, in a compound of a village along with their family. And they had to stop doing that because the factories were doing in one hour what it took them one month to do. So they destroyed the factories. England was militarized to fight the Luddites unlike ever, never before in its history. 
and the new guy in the building was put down. It is not uh, an accident that the area where the Luddites live is not in hand, and there's a myth about or a story of Robin Hood in that, in that area, and there is some uh, basis of truth to that. So what human beings used to do for themselves, what we used to do for ourselves, are now commodities to be sold or bought. We don't even take care of our own children. We pay somebody to take care of our children because global capitalism demands so much from us that we don't even have time to do that. So today in the 21st century, this practice of commodification of life has reached global proportions. And for example, it pits US American workers against workers in the rest of the world. Who can offer the cheapest labor? Now, US Americans, as a result, are in prison and out of jobs. The military now has power to arrest civilians. One could even say that our attention is being colonized. We are more distracted. We find it more difficult to be present. Who owns your attention? To whom or to what do you pay attention? Foucault has now appropriated the concept of a person. Corporations are more powerful than people, or rather, the most powerful kind of people are corporations. Now, coloniality is a consequence of colonialism. It is a particular structure of power that was set up then, and it continues to this day with a few changes. It is hegemony, which means subtle, sometimes subliminal exercise of power. The master narrative, the powerful, hegemonic, single story we are all exposed to is as follows. Human history started with people being in a state of nature, and it ends with European civilization. Secondly, the differences between Europeans and non-Europeans are natural and not the consequences of a history in the structure of power. That's the story that you've been fed. That's the single story that you've been fed. The discovery of America, for example, led to the 15, 1555 debate in Valladolid, Spain, for the first time ever regarding the indigenous people and whether they were human or not. So coloniality set up a hierarchy of categories of people. These categories dictate what we are worth depending on our position with respect to profit making. This leads to the second contribution to the new world, all the new world, to our modern world, and to global capitalism. In effect, Quijano and Wallerstein argue that ethnicity did not exist before the creation of America. I thought that was a rather stunning statement to make. Not based on genetics or ancient history. Ethnicity corresponded with the division of labor and not just labor, but the largest systematic exploitation of human labor that the world had ever seen. Slavery for blacks, repartimiento, mita, and peonage for indigenous Americans, endangered servitude for European working class. Of course, before the discovery of America, there were differences of skin color in between nations in all of the continents. But these differences were at a horizontal, not a hierarchical level. There were differences of degree, not of superiority. An unintended consequence is at the same time, is that at the same time, this kind of division of labor promoted the creation of ethnic pride and socialization of families and children into particular ethnic groups in quotation marks. <coughs> And ethnicity was a double-edged sword since it also played a part in the independence movements. What I mean by that is that when indigenous African descent or other non-European peoples participated in the struggle for independence, they also claimed a piece of the pie. First in Latin America and most recently in the United States. And by that I mean the civil rights movement. And I Believe that you have watched a video of um, Haiti, right? So you know 
it, it, that's a perfect example of how labor is associated with ethnicity. So if you go having sugar cane, that's a medium labor, and you are at a lower level than if you're on top of the horse. So the Dominicans are on top of the horse, the Haitians are on the ground. So just because of that, then you have a particular ethnicity associated with you and a particular status associated with you. And then the Dominicans can actually push that to the extent that they can actually say that they're white and the Haitians are black. But, but it's all associated with labor. It's all associated with what it is that you do. Another example that doesn't include ethnicity is the German population that for 40 years was separated into the East and West Germany. When the war came down, the West Germans looked down upon the East Germans as if they were not only a different ethnic group, but almost a different race, but also as if they were inferior. And you're talking about Germans, you're talking about the same people, you're talking about the same facial ex expressions or comple uh, complexity of skin color, etc. And you have the same kind of dynamics. Why? Because the East Germans were poor and educated and skilled. So ethnicity and uh, ethnic identity has always been tied to your labor occupation. And it all started with the discovery of America. Closer to home, it is the division of labor that fabricates the Sureño and the Norteño gangs and the construction of the Mexicans, those who do menial jobs, those who do the shed work. This construction of ethnicity based on the division of labor also creates a slippery slope into a master single story. When people begin talking about Latinos, they jump to talking about those who do the menial work and from there immediately jump to talking about Mexicans and then to legal aliens and then the need to get rid of them. Racism arose when ethnicity did not fit the notion of popular sovereignty. In the United States, for example, we, the Europeans, were the only people who were created equal. In, in Latin America, racism was not black or white like in the United States because racial mixture took place from the start of the European invasion. Thus, the Puerto Ricans had a rainbow concept, the Mexicans had the mestizaje concept, or the cosmic race. We're all different races, but we're all one race. But there is definitely pigmentocracy in Latin America. The lighter skin is considered superior <coughs> to dark skin, but the difference is that in Latin America, unlike the United States, you can buy whiteness. In colonial times, if you had money, you could buy a certificate of whiteness, and that made you white. white. That would never happen in the United States, colonial times, or any time even today. In the United States, liberal racism became necessary in the placing of Native Americans in reservations to maintain the power structure, to keep workplace and social hierarchies. Why, for example, do you think we associate Asians with doing laundry. Do you think that they just prefer to do laundry? No, it's because they were not allowed to do any other kind of job. So now we have associate the ethnicity with laundry. Today it is meritocracy, which is subtle racism to keep up with the times. Now if you don't succeed, it's your fault. It's your culture's fault. The evidence is statistical, therefore scientific. So the third factor that the Discover America contributed to global capitalism is a new and improved world, the global economy, or what I call MICE, because it sounds good. What I mean by MICE is the military industrial complex and entertainment. It is this, the new world, if this is the new world, then we are not tied down to tradition, feudalism, privilege, etc. Modernity will bring the answers to all inequality, and ever since then, everything is defined as new. History is not important. Forget the past, 
move forward. History, therefore, is deprived of its moral depth and is not used to analyze current issues. This is why I think Diaz named Oscar after the British writer Oscar Wilde. And I know this is kind of a stretch, but bear with me. Like the protagonist in Oscar Wilde's only novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray, we sell our soul to the devil so that we can keep our beauty, our American dream, which is now and has always been a global dream, a human dream. And hidden in the closet is the reality of production and profit making, which is child labor, prison labor, underpaid labor, sexual slavery. This situation reminds me also of Ursula Le Guin's The Ones Who Walk Away from Mandela's. I just noted the hierarchy of differences of what my colleague Mutombo Mpanya calls <coughs> difference as deficit was created after the discovery of America. But with modernity, we also had the opposite. There is the notion of sameness as deficit. You cannot stay the same. You have to have more growth, more good things, more profit, new money, more weapons, more colonies, more new power. You need to shop, 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 as President Bush said after 9-11. We moderns are like galactus. We have an insatiable hunger. Another part of the poem, The Schooner Flight, by Derek Walter, which Diaz partially quoted again in an epigraph at the beginning of the book, <coughs> reads as follows. Progress, Shabin, that's what it's all about. Progress leaving all we small islands behind. I was at the wheel, then sitting next to me, gaffing, crisp, bracing day, a high running sea. Progress is something to ask Caribs about. They kill them by millions, some in war, some by forced labor, dying in the mines, looking for silver. After that, niggers. More progress, and to like see definite signs of mankind change, then I ain't want to hear progress is history's dirty joke. So even after 9-11, Bush said that the best way to show the terrorists that they did not win, what the American people should do is go out and shop. So, after the discovery of America provided capitalism with the elements that I just mentioned, uh, what happened to the people and the nations in the American continent? So, in colonial America, the continent, uh, people's individual struggles eventually led to the Revolutionary War in the United, in the United States and the Wars of Independence, or Guerra de Independencia, in Latin America. And these are supposed to set the stage for a new start for all people in the hemisphere. So everybody here thought, okay, we leave the old world behind, we're going to start a new. And people still, immigrants still feel that way. Uh, this is where all continental Americans share a struggle for dignity, for democracy, and social justice, and against the absolute power of the monarchy, power to the people. But the Foucault makes it all invisible. We don't remember that we have the same political cradle, the div division of labor separates us, we, the continental hemispheric people, into rival factions. We see Dominicans and Mexicans as aliens to our culture. In fact, the Harvard scholar Samuel Huntington warns that Hispanics are a threat to the identity of the United States. Mexicans, especially, he argues, are fundamentally different from other immigrants and should not be allowed in this country. He raises the threat of bloody race wars if we continue to let them in. Well, the Guerras of Independencia are the point in which the interests of all continental Americans come together. They also mark the point where U.S. America diverges from, the, from Latin America. The U.S. becomes more new and more modern because it was in the right place at the right time. For two key factors to coincide, rapid capital development and its relationship to Great Britain after 1812. 
And so as the United States became more powerful, Latin Americans, Cubans, for example, just admired the, the, the power of the United States. And they wanted to be modern. Everybody wanted to be modern. And yet there was a dark side to the problem of US development after it became an imperial democracy in the 20th century. There was violent expansion into Indian lands in northern Mexico, a quasi or an almost protectorate over the Caribbean and Central America, Panama, Philippines, Guam, and Samoa, economic and political hegemony over Latin America after World War I. This means armed intervention and political economic meddling in Latin America and the imposition of world hegemony after World War II. And even though the United States is not as powerful as it was before, it pretty much is the, the, the number one uh, to, to go to when the world needs something. So I'm trying to give enough time for uh, questions. Um, Currently, the relation between Latin America and the United States have shifted from one of dependency. And um, there is an uh, index of social inclusion that is put up by the Organization of American States. And it actually shows the uh, middle class in Latin America um, competing with the middle class in the United States for the attention of corporations from the United States. Uh, in some social indicators, there are actually um, countries, well, the United States is in the bottom when it comes to parental leave. Countries in Latin America give more parental leave with pay than the United States. So um, some, of that, some of the relations of that balance is changing. Um, but I want to get to my final point. How does the Fuku work through hegemony? How does the Fuku modern world, global capitalism, work through hege hegemony and invisibility, and how does it affect us all here today? How can we use the Safa or the Consafos to fight back? Foucault works through coloniality by convincing people that they belong into separate categories or ethnic groups, by making all of our commonalities invisible, by making our inter interdependence invisible, by making the practice of compassion and the protection of human di dignity very difficult because human bodies who are the byproduct of global capitalism are seen as expendable, as trash. But it's not all bad news. The discovery of America, or rather the invasion of this continent and its peoples, provided the basis for a utopia of social equality and individual liberty. What this utopia has masked inequalities in their articulation with power, it has also allowed for space for debate and the possibility for people to regulate the power of the state and the global economy. It opens the space for subversive complicity. Unfortunately, I don't have time to explain that, but subversive complicity is a good thing. In Latin America, the presence of the indigenous people, even under conditions of domination, was the basis for a utopia of reciprocity of social solidarity and direct democracy. This is what living together does to people. They learn of each other's humanity. And I believe this is also beginning to happen in the United States, especially in California, where we have the highest incidence of mixed marriages. In the present crisis, some of the oppressed have been organizing themselves in this way within the general framework of the capitalist market. For example, here in San Marcano, we have a North Bay organizing project and the Jobs for Justice organization, along with 1,375 nonprofit organizations, which had $1.2 billion in revenue last year. Um, and all of them together are keeping the long struggle for humanity alive. So, Noma County has more nonprofits than any other county in the United States. Sooner or later, however, it is possible to imagine these continental American utopias will be joined together to create an offer to the world a specifically continental American utopia. The movement of peoples and cultures throughout the continent and their gradual integration into a single power framework is or may become one of its most effective foundations. And by that, I don't mean a single power framework governed by the United States, but one that is democratically agreed upon. We must all be heroes and stand strong against this force 
that threatens to destroy life. As Krishna Murthy once said, if parents really love their children, they will not let them go to war. If we believe in the sanctity of life and the centrality of human dignity, and if we integrate this belief into our everyday actions, there is hope for survival with dignity. To paraphrase the poem in the book, you are either nobody or I am a nation. I, I am either nobody or I am a nation. When Oscar got back to Santo Domingo to be with Yvonne, the taxi driver asked him what he's doing here, and Oscar says, the ancient powers won't leave me alone. The Greeks called those ancient powers the Furies. They demand vengeance, an eye for an eye. Today, we, must, we too must stand up for the dignity of human beings. And by that, following that sentence after the previous one, I mean that you have to engage in vengeance in a eye for an eye. So, I think I've been videotaped, so that's clear. All that struggle that I'm talking about and that Oscar is talking about is based on love. Thus, though the novel begins with the destructive power of Galactus, it ends with an act of love and supreme sacrifice for human dignity and the words, the beauty, the beauty, in opposition to the last words in the famous film, Apocalypse Now, which ends the horror, the horror. In some respects, this Galactus is created by us. It is said that the Buddha's teachings are like rain that benefits everyone. The sun seeds grow into flowers and others grow into trees. It's not the rain's fault, but the capacity of each individual to grow. Similarly, we could say that the Foucault, the Foucault's teachings of endless hunger for profit, endless consumption, endless pleasure, remember Union Sex Edition? Endless power reign on everyone equally. And it is not the Foucault's fault or the global economy's fault, but our own capacity for delusion and our tendency to fall in love with power. So the Safa or Consafos is our own free will, but most important, our sense of love and compassion. And if that doesn't work for you, then what about the realization that we live in an inter interdependent world, a karma world, what goes around comes around. around. But this is a never-ending story. The first 200 pages, the second part, the first part is 200 pages in, in the novel, the second part is 100 pages, and the third part is 35 pages. The last part has the final journey, the end of the story, and then a separate and title section that begins with, it's almost done, and finally, the last letter. In the untitled, it's almost done, three-page section, Junior mentions how Oscar never defaced a book in his life, and yet, in a stronger loving world, the last horrifying chapter of Watchmen, he circled one panel three times. This is where, after Bates' mutant brain has destroyed half of New York to save the world, he tells Dr. Manhattan, I did the right thing, didn't I? It all worked out in the end. And Manhattan answers, in the end? Nothing ends, Adrian, nothing ever ends. That includes the struggle against Foucault, against the Galactus military industrial complex that threatens to devour our nameless lives. So even though I have to stop here because I want to take some questions, this is not really the end because the struggle continues. Thank you. Okay, how does capitalism own our attention? Um, I think that there is so much entertainment going on that, um, that can pull your attention. Let, let me give you an example. Um, I'm trying to think of... Um, I just like out of his name. There's a Russian author of the Gulag Archipelago. Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn, thank you. Um, he was in, in, in the Gulag, which is the Siberian uh, jails in, in the Soviet Union, uh, for speaking and writing against the, the Communist Party. 
and, and the books were forbidden in the Communist Party, in, in, in the Soviet Union. Um, fascinating story of how he wrote a novel in toilet paper, the novel was smuggled out, published, and embarrassed the hell out of the Soviet Union, so he was free, and he came to live in the United States. After living in the United States, so she needs to say, you know, I'm beginning to get the sense that we're just as much in trouble in the United States as we were in, in the Soviet Union. Because in the Soviet Union, we were not allowed to read the books that really matter. But in the United States, we are flooded with so much garbage of books, of stuff to read, that nobody reads the books that we should be reading. So that's how um, capitalism, global capitalism, can flood you with uh, images, with iPhones, with YouTube, with Twitter, with so many things that your poor little brain has only so much capacity to actually pay attention, not your human, you don't be offended by it. Um, we, our brain doesn't have the capacity to actually do all of that, so now we have computers and all of that. But uh, I think entertainment is the key for hegemony, which is a very subtle form of slaving people and having people actually enjoy their slavery. You say that Foucault is the antagonist of the story, though in the book and in life antagonists aren't very clear. Question one, who do you think won Oscar or the Foucault when the novel ended? Okay, uh, I think that, as I said at the end, I think that nobody won at the end. I think the struggle continues. Um, and I think that's the message of the novel, is that it is a continuing struggle. Question two, or is the resolution of the conflict clarity or the same as who the antagonist is? As a clear winner and clear loser. Um, I don't understand the second part. But yeah, I don't think that the, the conflict is really resolved. Do you think that the Foucault call you know, will always remain and why? Um, I think that um, the gift of consciousness that we have gives us the ability to use consciousness for creation. We're like demigods. We can create things, and it also gives us the power to destroy things. And it's so easy to destroy things. And, and I think that, um, like someone in my classroom was talking about how capitalism engages in creative destruction, right? Uh, you take over factories and you fire everybody, take over the pension, and that's creative destruction because it makes you wealthy. Um, I think that as long as we remain humans, and, and, and human nature remains what it is right now, the jury is out whether it can change. Um, I think that the Foucault, um, the, the curse of um, greed, a total avarice, and total consumption, infinite consumption, and the, the one for more and more and more, that is going to continue as long as we remain humans. But I think that we're hitting a point where the planet won't be able to carry that kind of uh, attitude, and we're going to have to really stand up to people who feel that way and show them a better way. Why is the coup so destructive in America? Why is it so bad? There is this, um, you probably can think of a lot of examples of people in the last few years who have been on top of the world in terms of wealth and fame and the ability, even in the case of Edwards, to be president of the United States, he had a good chance. Um, good looking guy, $400 haircuts. Um, pretty wife, happened to be suffering from cancer. And he lost it all because he had an affair with the secretary. Um, and when, when he was interviewed years after, or a year after, or sometime after, he said, I felt like I was like a dog, that I could do anything and get away with it. And I think that power does that to us. If you have power, it gives you the sense that 
that you can actually get more power and that you can do whatever the hell you want and you don't have to be responsible to anybody. And that's just in the nature of power itself. Do you believe global capitalism will ever end or just ruin the world? Um, I think that's up to you guys because um, I, I'm already 65. I'm not going to be around for the next 100 years. And I think the next 100 years are going to be decisive in which way do we go. I think that um, this is a window of opportunity, and there have been a lot of windows of opportunity, but this is one where we as people, as member, members of society, can either stand up and really organize, which is the key word, organize and, and push for uh, different kinds of governing, uh, different kinds of economy, a more sustainable economy, and I think that it can be done, but it's really up to you, the new generation. That's just about perfect. That's perfect timing. Okay. Thank you very much.